we are going to kick it off the fifth um, edition of the Baird Symposium webinar series. And this one is titled Effects of Noise and EMF on Benthic Communities. I will pass it over to Jen McCann to share a bit more of what even that means and who is speaking today. So Jen, take it over. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for uh, joining. We appreciate it. Um, as Avi mentioned, this is our um, last of five webinars, which we've been working on with you. As, um, as you know, the purpose of these webinars is to learn and to share information um, between uh, researchers and stakeholders. So, um, you know, it, it's been a real interesting interactive um, webinar series, which again was supposed to be in person, but this has been so successful. The plan is to continue this um, starting in January. So a survey will be going out um, to ask you all, um, what other topics are you um, interested in? So again, the, the purpose of this is to bring researchers from all over the world who are working on and asking questions about the effects of offshore wind on um, benthic communities. And, um, and it's to connect with stakeholders, whether you're a regulator, a community member, or a fisherman, um, to ask questions and to, um, to make sure that this research is really um, directed and responding to the concerns um, so that we can learn more um, and learn as we go, as, as this um, new industry um, grows. So today, um, our fifth webinar, the focus is the effects of noise and EMF on benthic communities. And, um, uh, and this topic was specifically requested by our stakeholders here in Rhode Island. And um, I, I'm certain that it's also of interest, again, because this was supposed to be in person, um, I'm sure it's of interest to many um, around the world. And that's why we have such a great following here. Um, the co-sponsors for this event, obviously I represent uh, Rhode Island Sea Grant, um, and then also the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography Coastal Resources Center. We're also partnering with the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, the Working Group on Marine Benthal and Renewable Energy Developments. Um, so we really appreciate partnering with you all and obviously with Venture Cafe and District Hall in Providence. Um, we have an action-packed panel. Um, and um, so we're gonna move on with this. So um, just wanted to introduce, we have, um, uh, Monique LaFrance Bartley, right here, who is co um, sponsoring, who's co moderating with me. And um, uh, I'm going to introduce you, Monique, in a minute. Um, but Cheryl, I wanted to know we, we, again, we want to make sure that this information is relevant to stakeholders. So, um, Cheryl, could you just introduce yourself and um, a little bit? Oh, sure. Hi everyone, I'm Cheryl Huber-Jones. I work with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm the state coordinator for the ocean. Um, uh, work on implementing our state's ocean action plan. I believe we're one of the first states um, that have one. It's different than the Rhode Island SAMP. Um, it covers a variety of different um, topics and actions um, to uh, ensure the ecolog ecological integrity of the New York Bight um, and be sure that any new use or existing use is being um, um, conserved and also um, is new uses will be able to um, responsibly be uh, developed. So yes, I also um, work on offshore wind in a variety of other capacities. Um, I'm less regulatory at my role at DEC and more um, in the planning uh, aspect of things. I work on, on NYSERDA's Environmental Technical Working Group for um, the state, which also takes a regional approach to um, developing offshore wind responsibly. And this topic is um, of this webinar today is very important to um, New York State as well as the region, obviously. And so uh, there's also a few actions in the Ocean Action Plan that deal with noise and EMF. So I thought it was a great opportunity to um, help moderate and be on this panel and um, inject some of the regulatory and stakeholder information that um, I'm hearing and that I'm sort of responsible for. So thanks for the opportunity and for uh, letting me say something. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl. So um, now we're going to hear um, from uh, Monique 
Monique is a uh, marine ecologist from the National Park Service and um, is a true Rhode Islander and has been very much involved in the, um, the, the, the researching the Block Island uh, wind farm in particular. So Monique, do you wanna introduce yourself and um, say why this topic is important to you? Hey Jen, hey everyone, thank you for having me today. As Jen said, my name is Monique LaFrance Bartley. I'm a marine ecologist with the National Park Service. Uh, recently, I just left uh, URI after being there for about 14 years. So it was a sad transition and I do miss Rhode Island and I'm happy to be here to join your conversation today. Um, as we all know, offshore renewable energy is being considered all throughout the US and a substantial component of such development are the cables that transmit energy to the mainland and provide us with the energy that we all enjoy. So this is a little bit interesting because the wind turbine structures themselves are visible. So for the Block Island wind farm, we can easily see those structures when we're on a boat, when we're on Block Island, when we're flying in an airplane, but we can't see the cables because they're buried beneath the seafloor and underground. So we may forget that these cables exist and that we need to consider the effects that they have or may have, excuse me, on the ecosystem and take that information into account in our planning efforts. We need to be sure that we understand that if there are any impacts from the cables with respect to noise, electromagnetic fields and heat on organisms such as fish, sturgeon, skates, rays and lobsters and eels, and if there are impacts, what those impacts are and how we may be able to avoid them or mitigate them. This information can be helpful to guide our path forward with future data collection, the permitting process and the development of offshore structures. So I just again want to thank Zoe and Peter and Luis for taking the time today to share their knowledge with us about these topics. Thank you, Monique. Appreciate that. So um, we're also, if you have any um, specific questions, um, we'd love for you to um, type them into the chat room and um, Monique and I will be managing that. And um, once the presentations are done, we will um, then take questions from um, the chat room. So again, Azure, also we have some amazing um, people who are agreeing to help us sort of insert some of the, or, and respond to some of the questions um, um, as they come up in the chat room. So um, again, action packed. Um, so uh, I'm gonna pass it over to the panelists. Panelists, if you could, um, I think we have Peter, Louise and Zoe in that order. Um, when you guys uh, present, if you could just introduce yourself as well. Well, good morning, US. This is Peter speaking. And I would say also good evening, Europe, I guess. And hello to everybody else. I will share my screen and hopefully it works. And uh, now you should see my name at least, and a cod. Uh, my name is Peter Sigray. I'm a senior researcher at the Royal Institute of Technology, and that is in Sweden, Stockholm. And right now it's snowing outside, first time for the year. So it's a diff different weather here than what you have uh, at the moment at least. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, even if it's online. And I'm gonna, I, I have been working with underwater noise and EMF in underwater environment for, for at least 10 years and have had a little bit of, of experience in this. But there's a lot of slides I'm gonna show. So I, 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 I go to the first one here and put wind turbines and wind parks in, in, in a perspective for you maybe some of you haven't really heard about or seen any of them. So they are pretty big beasts. They are, today it's quite regularly that we uh, have six megawatt of uh, uh, turbines installed. And you see up on the left side here, and it has a sweeping area of 18,000 square meters. And I've just looked at it that you, on the other side, you see Mead Stadium in Providence. And during, according to NFL, the field should be 5,351 square meter. That means that three of these, a little bit more than three of these fields is the swept area. And that is a rather large sales. So of course they are producing a lot of power. And what I show you down here on the left side is actually a, 
Vestas turbine, which is on, on, on development, is not sold yet and it's 10 megawatt already. And the, the, the trend is that these things are growing all the time. And 10 megawatt, if you have 100 of them, you will have about a nuclear power plant already. And what I show on the right side here is, is outside England, and there are six megawatts, about 50 of them. And this is quite usual that you install about 50 of them. So it's kind of a half of a, of a nuclear power plant per field. So they, they are big infrastructures. And, and the question arises, of course, that do they have any kind of, of, of impact, uh, these things? Uh, oh, sorry. It, on, on, on the environment. And yes, there are like four phases when you build them or when they start building. And first one is the survey, and then it's the construction phase, and the operational phase, and the decommissioning phase. And the decommissioning phase, we don't have much experience because there are no uh, parks that have been decommissioned yet. But we think at the moment that the construction phase is actually the, the big. Uh, producer of noise and the operational phase is the big producers of electromagnetic fields. And to put, uh, uh, the, uh, when it comes to, to construction, more than 80% uh, of the uh, wind turbines in Europe at least has been piled. That is that you, you, you like a nail, you, you hammer it into the wood, but you hammer the pile into sediment. And while doing this, I, I show this table on the, on the right side. You can see the pile driving is producing a source level of 240 decibel, underwater decibel. It's not the same as air decibels. And it's actually comparable to the most, to the, sorry, to the strongest uh, sonars that we have on, on ships today. And the only sources that are stronger are air guns used in prospecting and, and in underwater explosions. But there is other ways to, to attach these foundations to the sediment. And I show in, in, the, in the picture here on the, on the lower right corner, and there are gravity bays. It's just a big lump of weight that keeps it in place, but also tripods and jackets. Block Island is using a jacket. But you have to remember that the monopile was pie, but also tripods and jackets are pie. So what's happening when you're doing the piling? Well, it's, it's a hammer. It's actually it's a hammer, but it's a 200 metric ton hammer that is banging on the upper part of the pile. And then a sound wave is produced that starts to travel downwards. And when it do this traveling, it emits sound in the water column, and then it emits sound in the sediment. And then it's reflected in the end cap and goes up again, and it rings for a while like a bell. So we get high sound levels in the water column, high sound levels in the sediment, but we also get some ground roll waves that you see here that disturbs the interface between, between water and the sediment. And hopefully you can, I have a recording some hundred meters away from a, from a piling event in North Atlantic, and it sounds like this. So it's about one pile of hammering per second. And this is how the, the pulse or the, the sound looks like about 500 meters away from the piling events. So you see it's very short. It's about 0.1 second. Uh, there is some ringing here, as I uh, said before, and there is a positive the maximum and there's a minimum level and already at or not already still at some hundred meters away it's pretty high the sound levels about 190 dB from zero to peak like this so is it a problem then well in Europe we are talking about two effects here when it comes to piling it's the same kind of effects that that we humans are, are subjected to and one is is if you go into a bar which is really noisy and you stay there for a long time, then we, due to the time and the noise, we can get some, some uh, hearing impairment uh, in, sorry, I'm jumping here, oh, to go back. Uh, so in the bar, you get this kind of, of effect or impact on your hearing because you are staying there a long time. But if you're standing just beside a 
fighter starting its engine, you immediately get, you get some kind of problem with your hearing. So we have to take into account both sound exposure, which is long-term impact, and sound pressure level. And what I'm showing in the upper figure is the sound pressure level. But if I show all the pipes all the time, uh, then it is the sound exposure instead that gets the problem. So how long is this, this event taking place? One, about one hour. So every second they have this hammering and it continues one hour for one pile. And then they move to the next pile and the next pile. So it's a pretty long pile. It, it actually covers a large area with noise for a long time. But things are more complicated than that. And that's what I want to show on, on the right side here. You cannot just look at the maximum levels. You also have to look at the spectrum from the piles. And what I'm showing there is a spectra of one pile pulse. And it's the, the energy you can be found from some few Hertz up to some 1,000, 2,000 Hertz. So it's spread around. Uh, around these levels at some hundred meters distance from the piling in them. And this has implications, especially for the animal. If you take some kind of, if you take, for example, let's say take mackerel, for example, they cannot hear at 1000 hertz, they hear below three, 400 hertz. So what happens about that doesn't matter for mackerel, but definitely for some whales, so that can hear up there. Okay. Uh, is there anything to do? Is there some kind of mitigation we can, can use? And yes, in, at least in Europe, there are two mitigation methods that are used, sometimes together and sometimes individually. But the most common one is the bubble curtain, as I showed to the left. And the bubble curtain is actually what it sounds like. It's a hose that is placed, placed around the pile about 100 yards from the center. And then there's an enormous amount of water, uh, air pushed into it. And it, and it produces a, a bubble curtain around the piling event. And actually the, the sound cannot penetrate it. Uh, part of it penetrates, of course, but, but it, there is a, quite a large attenuation. The, the problem with this is that if you have a strong tide or wind, it blows away the curtain, just like in a window curtain. So on the other side, on the right side, we have what's called an air isolated steel barrier with the internal bubble screen. And that means what you see there is the white steel, it's air inside and that, uh, that function as, as an as a air bubble curtain, but they also add this bubble curtain inside. So it's actually two, two mitigation techniques in the same place. So it, it in principle mimics the bubble curtain and this one, the advantage is that it is, is, of course, not disturbed by waves and tides. And disadvantage is maybe that it doesn't have the same kind of attenuation. So, but to understand also the impact on animals, one has to look into what is sound. And uh, we humans, we are listening at pressure variations. And pressure variations, what you see on the black uh, arrow pointing upwards. That is a pressure, pressure variation. So the pressure wave goes from left to right in this picture. But you also see on the red uh, arrow, there's a particle motion. And animals in the ocean, some of them can hear waves, pr uh, pressure variation, and some animals can hear particle motion. So cod, macrilla, sharks, and cuttlefish can only sense particle motion, while cod, seeds, and whales can sense pressure variations. And both particle motion and pressure variations is produced when you pr have no uh, underwater sound. You also see that cod can actually sense both. So there are those animals who are actually sensitive to both these entities. So let's jump and look at some measurement I did some years ago in the North Atlantic. And uh, this is actually now measurement of particle motion. And particle motion is measured as acceleration, that's meter per square second. And on the left uh, figure, you, where I'm pointing with the arrow, we have mitigation system in place. And we have a bubble curtain 100 yards away, and we have this air uh, steel barrier, and we have the internal bubble screen. And then you can see that they started the piling. I have to be careful here, started the piling with a soft start, increasing the hammer energy, and then there was a full hammer energy, a little bit more than one hour. 
and the pile was then 30 meters uh, pushed down into the sediment. And then they took off all the mitigation techniques and they did the same kind of piling on, on, a, on, a, on a second pile. And you can see the difference here, it's about 25 dB uh, difference in, 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 uh, in particle acceleration level. So it actually works quite well, the, these mitigation systems. However, it's more complicated than that because if we take a look at the spectrum again of the unmitigated, which is the blue, you can see that at higher frequencies, and the mitigation starts to kick in at high frequencies here. So it doesn't really affect anything below two, three, four hundred hertz. So if you have an animal that is sensitive to low frequencies, the mitigation systems that I showed you doesn't really do any good here. But for those animals that are sensitive up, up above these frequencies, it has a definite effect. So it, it's a little bit more complicated than, than, than what you first maybe can see. So that thereby I, I somehow end the part of underwater noise uh, and some, it quite summarize that, yes, there is loud sounds produced. Uh, they are comparable to really loud sound sources. And as there are so many turbines, it's going to be going on for a very long time, but there are mitigations techniques actually to, to use to reduce uh, the sound levels. And let's then turn to electromagnetic fields. And I always like to say that we, there, before humans started to use electricity, there was electromagnetic fields around us. And one of the strongest, of course, Earth's magnetic field. And it's, it is really one of the strongest. Uh, if you have a compass in your hand, it almost always works, this, this compass. Uh, but also the ionosphere and the magnetosphere uh, in, has, has a kind of a noise that, that gives some kind of alternate magnetic fields. And um, these magnetic fields, when they change a little bit, they give rise to electrical fields in, in the ocean. But as we humans has now come into, into this, this uh, game, so to say, we have introduced the power grid, which is a huge uh, producer of electromagnetic fields. The railway system in, in Europe, at least, uh, produce a lot of uh, EMF, but also what I show here, the wind park is a potential producer of electromagnetic fields. And I want to start here on the right side to show you a little bit about, about electromagnetic fields, because there are this uh, Maxwell equation explaining them. And what we have here now is, is the green is a cable, and the blue arrow shows there's an electric current running the cable. And is it, when it runs like that, you get a magnetic field circulating the cable. So you have a horizontal magnetic field and you have a vertical magnetic field. You don't have any parallel magnetic fields. However, if this electric current is varying, there is also electric field, which is the black, black arrow shown here. So, so there is, when you have alternate current, you have electric and magnetic field. When you have direct current, you just have uh, magnetic fields from electric current. Now you place a second conductor or cable beside it. Now you see that the, and the current, the electric current is, is in the opposite, opposite direction. You can see this, these two arrows, they are, 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 are pointing on in different directions. So there is partly a canceling effect here. So there is something good. So if you put these close together, you get a, a, a partially canceling effect. And, and that's a good thing to remember here that, that the more you can put them together, the more you cancel the, the, the magnetic fields. And this is actually what they're doing when it comes to these high voltage direct current cables that are used, for example, at cross some cable going from New Haven to Long Island and the Neptune cable going from New Jersey to Long Island. You have two cables bundled together and in one is the current going one direction in the other is going the other direction. Okay, this is not from wind farms or wind parks, but these are actually used for wind parks when the wind parks are, are, are located far offshore. If the wind park is located Nearer to the coast, and they are using three-phase 
these are the three conductors in the same cable, and you get the same kind of canceling effect here. And these kind of systems are called high voltage AC systems. And Block Island, all the Block Island cables are of this type. Uh, and especially, I'm, I'm going to show you some results from the sea to shore cable here soon. So how does it look like? Well, I, I take this as a good example. I think this is the largest wind park in the world right now. It's Hoons Rev 2, west of Denmark in, in, the, in the Northern Atlantic, in the North Sea. And it's, I don't know how many it is, 50 uh, turbines, and they are radially connected, which means that, that they are, the, this turbine up on the left part here is connected to the nearer one, and then they are connected. So the electric current in this cable is slowly increasing as more power is produced. And then there's a collection point that collects all these and transforms the AC currents in this field into DC current and transfer it back to the mainland where it is converted back into AC currents. And you can see the 30 kilometers and this is like 10 kilometers wide and about five kilometers, um, uh, the width and the height is about 10 kilometers. So they are pretty large areas covered by by, by cables, and this cable could potentially be a barrier for some animals that, that, that have some kind of movement over it. And of course, inside these this, uh, power parks, it, it, the wind parks, it's, it's, it's a lot of cables and, lot of, and can also be expected to be a lot of electromagnetic fields inside them. Uh, is, can you measure it? Is there any way to actually measure the, the effect from cables? And my answer is yes, this is a, a sensor that we used outside Block Island. It has also used it at the, at the Cross Sound Cable and Neptune Cable. It's a sledge. And you can see here on the sledge that there is a white small box here, which is the flux gate. It can measure the magnetic field. And the, the cross on top of it can measure the electric field. And this was towed behind a boat uh, over the cable. And the, uh, crossing the cable, we can measure the, the electric and the magnetic field generated by the cables at the seabed, so to say, not immediately close to the, to the cable. And this is an experiment we did outside New Haven on the cross sound cable. And on the upper left part, you can see the track we did with this, with this sensor. And up, up on the other side, you can see the results. And this was one, this was the strongest observed field we had on this whole cruise here. And what you see on the upper part is here the cross cable signal, the parallel cable. If you remember, I showed you that there should be no signal parallel to the cable, and there is no signal, and then the vertical uh, signal here. And if you put this together, you can see the total magnetic field. And this here is the earth magnetic field. And you see this, can see the disturbance, which is about 20 micro Tesla here, uh, which is fairly large actually, as the magnetic earth magnetic field outside New Haven is about 48 micro Tesla or something like that. So it's comparable to the earth magnetic field, but smaller still. I show you just how it looked like when you made more transects. And this is kind of more the normal situation. Here you see every line of this is, uh, this is about 300 meters here, and this is about uh, 60 meters here. So it's not uh, the same dimensions in X and Y direction. And this is one, this is the, the really strong, uh, trans, strong crossing, uh, strong signal from the cable. But most of them are not that strong. So it's more normal to have like two, three micro Tesla uh, deviation from Earth magnetic field than to have bigger than that. To our great surprise, we had a very strong AC field uh, from the DC cable. We thought that we're not going to have any AC field from the DC cable, but we were wrong. And this shows just the, the spectrum from that. And it's a lot of overtones, a lot of, and of course, the dominating one here is the 60 hertz. And the explanation that we got was that, that the rectification going from 60 hertz on, in the land station to DC is not very clean. So there is some impurities of 60 hertz still in, in the cable uh, left uh, that, that, that we could see, apparently. So re just remember that, that the DC cable is definitely not 
uh, free from AC currents. Now turn to the Block Island, which is a wind park, as everybody knows in the US. Uh, I think the only wind park, offshore wind park at the moment. And we made some measurement here, about 50 transects. And this is an AC cable. Uh, so we should uh, expect to have AC fields. And we did, of course, have AC fields. And I show you up here on the left side, typical strong fields that we, that we measured. Uh, and on the left side here, we have magnetic fields. And on the right side, we have electric fields here. And it, there is a difference between what we saw on the, on the static magnetic field. And that is that, that it's observable. The magnetic field is observable up to 30, 40 meters from the cable crossing. And the electric field, as you see, is actually observable 100 meters from the, from the cable. So this, this, these AC cables seem to spread more. Of that, but also to be fair that most of the crossings were weaker. And you can see here a, a, a more weaker type of, of results that we had uh, from, from the cable. And a kind of surprise here is that, that, that the DC cable uh, was producing more AC, uh, AEMF than the AC cable did. So I think that's kind of a good, good indication at least. Also, we always have to show a spectra so that we know what we're doing. And you can see here very clearly that 60 hertz is dominating, which is expected because it's producing 60 hertz electric current, this, this wind farm. So mitigation on EMF, there's not much done on that. So this is more my private list on it. Uh, one can increase burial depth of the cable if you want to decrease the DC part of the magnetic field, but not the AC part because it spreads much more. Uh, you can restrict and regulate overtone emission of the HVDC cable to bring down these this impurities that sh somehow not should be there really. You can develop concentric HVDC cables. And I, I look quickly on Google on net and there is a company today stating, I haven't checked it really, but the state they have a concentric cable. And I'll show it here in the lower right part here. And concentric means that, that they are, the, the center of the two conductors are in the same point. These have total cancellation and there should be very little uh, uh, fields leaking out from this. You can also increase transmission voltage, which brings down the, the current because it's the electric current that actually produced the feeds. Use helical twisted AC cables. That is usually used today, but sometimes it pops up that it's, no, we want to have three separate cables put like 10 meters away because it's better for if you break one cable, it's cheaper and things like that. Uh, but mostly today in, 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 the, in, the, in the Europe, it's, it's twisted uh, aid. Uh, AC cables used, and then improved load balance on, on these AC cables. And that is that the fields that we, I showed you just from Bok Island is due to that, that the three electric currents in the three conductors, they don't have the same amplitude and they don't have the same phase. And what happens is that you get kind of a rest current. It looks like there's one current just going, some few amps, but it's still there and it produces uh, the fields that we observe. So what is my take home message from, from these two parts on, on, on the physics of, of acoustics and the physics of EMF? Well, it is complicated and one has to be a little bit careful uh, going, rushing in and, 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 and stating things. And that was my last slide. I just want to thank all the organizations to the left and all the people to the right who has been involved in this work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I will say while uh, the screens are being swapped around that um, BOEM, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management in, in uh, the US here, they have uh, constructed their first two pilot turbines in federal waters offshore of Virginia. And they um, use this opportunity to um, uh, measure the differences in one mitigation uh, versus one that was unmitigated for the bubble curtain and the, and the noise. So I believe that study is um, coming out soon, uh, the end of this year, I believe it was, it was expected. And then I also heard last week that um, 
uh, Orsted and their contractors are, uh, have conducted an EMF studies in the inner array cables at Block Island Wind Farm, as well as the um, wind farm to shore uh, aspect of that project. I know that yours focused on um, the sea to shore, which connects the island to the mainland, but um, I believe that study is also anticipated um, in, in, in the coming months. So we'll look forward to that. Thank you for your information. Thank you. Louise, are you able to um, upload your, there we go. Yes. Uh, can you see that? Uh, yeah, and we are a little bit uh, off schedule. So if we could just sort of streamline the next two presentations, that would be great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Louise Roberts. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Cornell University in New York State. Uh, much of my research is based around, has been based around underwater noise and the potential impacts on fish and invertebrates. Um, and in recent years, my interests have particularly migrated towards the impact of seabed vibration uh, produced by man upon the benthos. Uh, so I'll talk about both of those aspects today. So I wanted to jump right in here and point out that our ocean is not a naturally quiet environment. There are a number of abiotic and biotic sources of sound, uh, both in the water column and in the seabed. So we have our abiotic sources such as wind, water currents, rainfall, bubbles and spray. And in addition to this, we have our animals living down there, which of course are moving around, interacting with each other. And many of them, um, such as marine mammals, but also fish and invertebrates are actively producing sounds within the water column. And so humans use underwater acoustics to navigate, communicate and find food and so do marine organisms. And so what we have is this kind of uh, soundscape underwater with these sounds um, aiding these animals to sense their surroundings. But also in addition to sound, there are likely vibrational cues which travel through the seabed. So we're talking about benthic animals today which live on and around the seabed. So we must recognize the importance of vibration within the seabed. And in much the same way that animals in the water column use sound, it's likely that these benthic animals are using vibrations in the surface of the sediment and inside the sediment um, to also interpret their surroundings. So we have, essentially we have in the water column a soundscape and in the seabed we have a vibroscape. And so those two things um, I want you to remember. However, contributing to these scapes, we have, of course, anthropogenic sounds. Uh, Peter's discussed the waterborne aspects of sounds in detail, but if we're considering our benthic animals, you must also consider the vibrations that man puts into the seabed directly. In the context of renewables, one of the uh, sources uh, that would do this uh, would be a pile driver. So in the diagram here, I've, I've got a pile on the right being driven down into the seabed. And not only would the energy radiate outwards from the pile, both through the water column as sound, but it would also go into the seabed um, as surface shear waves, um, as well as sound waves from the tip and the sides of the pile. And not only does this vibration enter the seabed, but it's likely at distance from this pile, um, the vibrations would then re-enter the water column as sound as well. And of course, I've used pile driving in as, as an example here, but within the context of renewables, of course, there are a number of sources that are directly contacting the seabed, um, such as uh, drilling, uh, dredging may be used, trenching for cables. Anything contacting the seabed is likely to make a vibration and the effects of these and the indeed the measurement of these uh, um, in the current state, um, not much is known. So the effects of any sound or vibration depend upon the hearing abilities of an animal. And so the diagram here, I've shown the noise uh, ranges or frequency ranges of some com common anthropogenic sources. Many of these involved in the life cycle of a wind farm. On our x-axis here in black, um, I have a Hertz scale from zero to 100,000 Hertz. And in green, the different bars are showing the frequency range of a number of different man uh, noise sources. Then if we look at fish, all fish species study to date can hear in some capacity, depending on your definition of hearing. Um, the majority of fish uh, hear up to around 1000 hertz. Uh, many fish hear uh, between 1 and 500 hertz. And I've plotted a few examples on this diagram just to give you an idea. So we have the goldfish here, the top red bar, 
um, has a very wide hearing range compared to the COD, which we might describe as having an average hearing ability in terms of frequency. And we also have other species which um, have a wide range, but going into the very low ranges of hertz, such as eels, which are sensitive to infrasound, which is below uh, 20 hertz. And some of these fish may also be sensitive to vibrations in the sediments too, particularly those that live directly on the seabed. But when we're talking about fish and invertebrate hearing, one of the things we must remember is that we commonly summarize sound levels from our noise sources in terms of pressure. But yet very few fish and invertebrates can detect pressure. And the majority of fish are actually more sensitive to particle motion of sound as Peter described in his own presentation. And so what we need to be mindful of is that we should be characterizing our noise sources, not only in terms of pressure, but also in terms of particle motion. And as I mentioned before, with our animals that are dwelling on the seabed, many of those are detecting vibrational waves. Again, we should be measuring those when we're characterizing our sources. When we're thinking about invertebrates, um, again, these are likely sensitive only to particle mo motion and not pressure, given that they have um, no airfield cavities in their bodies. And you can see again, I've just plotted a few examples here and we have a range of hearing abilities and we have some demonstrated um, vibrational sensitivity ranges uh, now for hermit crabs and blue mussels. So if you take this diagram as a whole, then you can see quite enough overlap here between the green bars, our man-made sources and fish and invertebrate sensitivity as a whole. The responses to sound and vibration are also defined, of course, by other aspects, and these are species and context specific. Uh, for example, the mobility of a species will define whether it can leave an exposed and noise exposed area or whether it's sessile and would just be exposed with, um, with no action that it could take. Also, the habitat requirements of the animal, even if it is mobile, if it moved to another area, could it survive in that area? This is, uh, also has an effect. And of course, the life cycle stages of this animal, such as European squid, you can see these uh, egg masses are laid on the seabed when they may be subjected to vibrational waves, whereas the adults are able to um, hover above the seabed and swim. And finally, responses are also dependent on the motivational state of the animal itself. So our own research with um, mackerel showed that schools of fish were responsive to sound when they were part of a school. But at night time, when the school broke up and individual fish were foraging alone, they were no longer responsive to sound. So you have this kind of context and motivational aspect to our responses. Of course, responses of animals also vary very much with the type of the source the distance the receiver is from the source and the characteristics of the source itself. And this is very difficult to measure since every noise is, is uh, distinctive in characteristics varying in source level, frequency content, pattern of occurrence. And if we're investigating our responses experimentally, then we have some logistical challenges um, to uh, get over regarding how we're setting up our experiments. Are we working in the vicinity of real sources such as next to an actual wind farm? Are we going to uh, stage small scale versions of anthropogenic noise sources? Or are we going to use uh, methods of replicating a source such as underwater that are noise projected to replicate a scenario? So responses will vary according to all of those factors I've mentioned previously, but what do we actually need to know? Well, our ideal um, output is a uh, knowing the dose of sound or vibration that elicits a particular response. So on the left here, I've uh, put two dose response curves, one for sprat and one for mackerel. On the y-axis, this is probability of response, and on the x-axis is sound exposure level. So essentially, this tells you the dose of sound that that animal um, will respond to. And you can calculate these for a number of different response levels, i.e. a threshold for injury, a threshold for behavioral change, for physiological change, etc. But in addition to that, what we also need to know is how sensitive is that animal to any sound or vibration. And so what we need is hearing um, sensitivity curves. So I've provided here one on the right of some uh, crustaceans. And so together, these, these two aspects, this dose response information combined with hearing sensitivity, sensitivity information um, will provide enough scientific information for managers to be able to set 
um, acoustic thresholds. However, there are some more challenges to consider, um, and uh, many of these uh, uh, to do with the fact that it's logistically challenging to study these species in the wild, um, and so many studies are undertaken in laboratory tanks. Uh, this is problematic for two reasons. The first is that the acoustics within laboratory tanks um, are not representative of open water. And secondly, the behavior of animals, of course, will vary um, within a laboratory tank as well. As I touched upon earlier, another issue is characterizing our source. We need to characterize sources in terms of the stimuli our animals are actually detecting. So we need to uh, characterize them in terms of substrate borne vibrational waves and particle motion in addition to pressure. And we need to combine those measurements with uh, understanding of hearing sensitivities of our organisms. And of course, the, uh, the big issue is a uh, lack of focus on the non-charismatic organisms um, and more research fo focus has been upon marine mammals, for example, rather than fish and invertebrates. Overall, what this means is we have this lack of information regarding exposure levels and specific responses, and it's difficult to provide evidence uh, for managers. Hence, a lot of our impact assessments are based on hypothetical scenarios rather than um, empirical data. So broadly, what do we know about the impacts of any sound or noise upon fish and invertebrates? Well, if you look at this table, the first column on the left here, it gives a range of impacts um, going from immediate or delayed death down to physiological changes. Um, and so at the top row here are death, injury and damage. Um, likely these effects are fairly rare, um, uh, would be exhibited in individuals in fairly close proximity to very high amplitude impulsive sources. And then we range down to things like the masking of sound, where we have uh, background levels of sound raised due to our noise source. Um, and this would affect and cover up biological sounds, as I described in my first slide, that are very important for animals to sense their surroundings with. We also have things like behavioral effects. These typically operate over a much larger distance from our sources. And they may range from things like a startle response, which may have little consequence to the animal itself, but may um, also include things like changes in distribution, changes in feeding, reproduction, and alterations in migration. And these are likely the most common effects that would be um, observed. How do these specifically relate to what we know about renewable sources? Well, here's our timeline, as Peter described, from our survey phase through construction, operational, and decommissioning phase. And highlighted in red here, um, as you can see, during the construction phase, we're likely to have high amplitude sources. And perhaps the construction phase isn't very long, um, but we have these sources which may have the potential to cause um, damage and injury and perhaps damage to hearing abilities. Also during the decommissioning phase, depending on the methods used to de decommission the turbines. In yellow, um, these are usually associated with chronic increases in background noise over time. So an example here would be the vessels used during surveys um, before the wind farms are built. And then the vessels used during the operational phase to maintain the individual turbines. So we have this increase in background noise over a long time period, which is likely to have these uh, lower level impacts, um, such as masking, behavioral change and physiological change. And of course, also during the operational phase, uh, which is a continuous uh, vibration from the tight turbine, you will have, um, we must remember that there's that coupling to the seabed and, and therefore that vibration could also go down into the seabed itself. So what do we actually know specifically about the effects of renewables on fish and invertebrates? Well, the research on this is fairly scarce. Um, what we do know is that if we have the hearing abilities of fish or invertebrates, we can estimate distances from renewable energy sources um, to work out um, what is being detected. And this has been attempted for cod, herring, dab, and salmon, and a few others. And we can calculate this zone of audibility around our noise sources. Um, however, uh, it's not always easy to do this. These are difficult to define. And the hearing abilities of, of fish um, 
as in ourselves, um, vary according to context as well and background sound levels. So what we can do is we can look at uh, particular phases of the wind farm and particular sources. So we know for construction methods such as pile driving, there's evidence, strong evidence now that impulsive sources cause behavioral effects. So uh, the uh, epigram on the top right here shows a school of fish which has um, temporarily dispersed and dropped down in the water column in response to impulsive sound. There's also evidence um, most recently with Pacific sardine as an example of explosions causing damage to the swim bladder and kidneys of fish. But when we're thinking about invertebrates, there are similarly no results available for invertebrates and renewables specifically. Um, what we do have, uh, I've just cited a few recent studies um, undertaken in laboratory tanks exposing invertebrates to continuous and impulsive sounds. And we've seen here changes in behavior, uh, changes in uh, bioirrigation behavior and, and reduced locomotion. What do we know about vibrational noise? Well, there are so few studies, I can almost cite all of them on one si slide. And Louisa, do you know what you've done? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what we do know um, is that there's a clear overlap between the vibrational hearing sensitivities of these animals and anthropogenic sources. And we've seen a number of changes um, when exposed to sediment vibrations, um, such as in bivalves, uh, scallops and mussels have shown behavioral changes such as valve closure, gaping, increased burial and siphon retractions. And even in scallops, compromised homeostasis um, and increases in mortality. In crustaceans, we've seen similarly behavioral responses in, in uh, behavioral changes in response to sediment vibration, um, including distraction from task um, and locomotory changes. And finally, in flatfish, uh, what little evidence there is suggests they can detect vibrations and that they would, for example, hide under the sediment in response to a strong uh, vibration. So here are our priorities. Um, as I outlined earlier, uh, we need more quantitative data from field studies with wild animals. We need to characterize our source. We need to understand hearing sensitivity and consider seabed vibration. And finally, um, it's important to note that noise rarely occurs on its own. So sound doesn't occur without a vibration if that con activity is contacting the seabed. And in addition to this, uh, many of these construction operations involve heat, light, chemicals, uh, EMF, et cetera. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Louise. Um, we're going we're gonna to just pause. We're going to ask Cheryl to ask a couple of questions um, before we go to the last presentation. So go ahead, Cheryl. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for that uh, information on noise, Louise. It was really... Um, it's, it's important to see uh, how very few studies there are in certain aspects of this. So um, definitely flagging it as um, a, a data gap is, is important for us all to think about. Um, I did have a question about um, sound pressure impacts on the operational phase of uh, larval stages of fish and shellfish. We know there's very much an acute impact to animals during construction, um, but it seems a lot of these studies are focused on perhaps the adult life stages of um, animals. So I'm wondering if you have any, um, know about any studies or can comment on um, the larval stage impact to fish and shellfish, as well as perhaps um, impacts on bivalve recruitment of the larva um, once it's acting planktonic, planktonic and wants to settle down out of the water column. Mm -hmm. So you're correct. Um, most of the uh, studies relating to fish and invertebrate larvae um, relate to high amplitude impulsive sources. Um, so I am not aware of any relating specifically to operational noise from uh, renewables. Um, what we do know is that during that operational phase, it's likely the sound levels are a lot lower than those uh, tested for higher amplitude sources. And um, so you may expect that you would have um, less impactful responses. And the work that has been done with um, 
larval fish has been mostly in the laboratory, to my knowledge, and has tested things like the effects of um, air guns and um, bio driving and, and in terms of lethal effects. And um, so you would really need specific studies targeting operational uh, uh, sound levels to understand those effects at those lower levels of sound. Yeah. And similarly, um, for invertebrates, the same, there's been a lot of work regarding invertebrate larva and how they definitely use sound during um, dispersal and settlement. And we know that for sure, um, but I am not aware of studies that have actually specifically uh, tested uh, settlement uh, during operational sounds, for example, where well, there is evidence to show that settlement of inverts can be uh, changed by exposure to shipping noise, for example, um, which is a continuous uh, noise source similar to operational. Yeah. No. No. Um, I have a question for both Louise and Peter. Um, it kind of talks about this noise issue, but also the pros and cons of the different um, foundation types. Peter, you had mentioned, or in one of your graphics, you showed the gravity base and the suction based, and then um, the different types of pile driving. So there's obviously going to be a um, benefit from not using any kind of pile drive driving construction. But I was wondering if there was, um, if you would like to discuss uh, more on the um, impacts of sound with the different base types. Um, and what that looks like in, in the research that you've come across or conducted yourself. I can start maybe then. Uh, like five, ten years ago, uh, monopies was like just, uh, you could just use them for 10 meters depth, but now you are using them already at 30 meters depth. So, so it seems that the monopy is, is, is still used for deeper and deeper waters. And what I showed you in my, fir in my first slide was the jacket and also the, the tripod, but these also have to be piled down many times. So you, don't, you can't go around it somehow. You, it, of course, in the jacket, it's, it's, not, it's not a six meter diameter pile you're piling down, it's, it's, it's a smaller pile, but still, it's not one pile, it's four piles instead in the, each corner. So, so at the moment, uh, all these techniques that we see it, it requires more or less piling as we see today, uh, irrespectively of depth. Gravity fundament, what I have seen uh, like in south of Sweden, it's, it's just used when it's rather shallow areas. At the, um, and, and I don't think that they really, that the, that the, the companies like gravity fundaments that are not reliable like, like the piling is. Um, so, uh, but then there's, a, I didn't show you the new generation of floating devices that are discussed now, but that's somehow a little bit ahead now that, that, that you have anchors and things like that instead. Uh, but, we, but we have not seen any of that on operational scale yet. So my answer is no, you, 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 you have to live with piling for a while. Okay, so um, now we're gonna, thank you very much. We're gonna go right to Zoe and Zoe, you're muted just so you know. Um, <clears throat> and she's gonna share her presentation now. Thank you very much for answering those questions. Okay, thank you, Jen. Okay, so I will turn our, our, our attention back to electromagnetic fields. And again, we'll talk about benthic communities in quite a broad sense. And I suppose in some context, I, I'll actually be talking more about the challenges associated with that. So why do we care about electromagnetic fields and what does it mean to our marine environment? Uh, natural electromagnetic fields actually present quite a lot of uh, ecologically important cues to our animals. Um, and so they can come in a variety of ways, whether that is to help them find their way to important resources or uh, they may be important in predator-prey interactions and communication or in finding mates. And so they do become quite important within their, their eco ecological context. And when we talk about these things, so electromagnetic fields or noise, we talk about them being pressures. And then we talk about our animals being the receptive species. And within this framework, I would really like us to take the vantage point of the receptive species. And in order to do that, in order to really understand how they uh, understand their electromagnetic environment, we need to look at various layers of information, some of which Louise has touched on as well. Um, so at the very core of that understanding is our ability, uh, their ability rather, to uh, understand the electromagnetic environment through their sensory biology and abilities, uh, their detection ranges. In terms of magnetoreception, we don't necessarily have a fantastic understanding of the, the uh, physiology associated with that. 
but we do know that it is broadly um, something that exists in uh, marine and terrestrial taxa. And so we understand that those animals can have either a magnetic map sense or magnetic compass sense, and that they are associated um, uh, and they help them to understand the geomagnetic environment and how to find their way. In terms of electroreceptive species, uh, we have a greater understanding of the organs involved in that in terms of the ampullary organs or the uh, lateral lines. And there's a great de degree of variation amongst the different species that we see. And in fact, some of the electroreceptive species are able to respond to indirectly to magnetic cues, uh, and that's from the induced electric fields that they provide. In terms of the detection ranges, we don't have that diagram that now, uh, Louise shows uh, in terms of the noise detection abilities, but we do understand that they uh, are, are responsive to ranges of magnetic fields uh, which correspond to the geomagnetic field. Um, and they are in the microtesla range and lower. And then with the bioelectric fields, we understand, and these are quite often important in the predator-prey interactions, we understand that those are both AC and DC in uh, the, the type of field that they produce. And again, they are very, uh, they tend to be very low voltages and low frequencies that are um, uh, that the species are receptive to. The next stage of information that we need to collect on the species we're interested in is how, how the perception of electromagnetic field really changes through the life history of an organism, not just in terms of the sensory ability, but also in, in relation to the biological function and the ecological context in which they perceive them. And we can draw on our understanding from uh, skates and rays, where we can see that the ability to detect a predator's bioelectric field occurs very early on in their life history while they're still uh, in an egg case. And that changes as the, the organism uh, matures in terms of uh, detecting a, a prey item um, uh, or possibly identifying a mate later on. And then as well, uh, there are multiple species that we're interested in. And depending on what species we're looking at, their life histories are actually very different to each other. And they interact with the benthic and the pelagic environment differently. And that brings me to my next layer of information, which is to really understand how the animals move through their environment and perceive these electromagnetic cues. And this is what helps us to inform us of the likely encounter rate in terms of actually coming across a cable EMF. In order to understand that, we really need to understand both the vertical and the horizontal movements of those animals on variable temporal scales. And that might actually be on a day-to-day -day basis, an hour-to-hour -hour basis. How often are they really likely to encounter an EMF from a cable? And is there a possibility that if they encounter multiple cables, might they learn from that experience? Do we know if that's possible? And so we'll turn our attention now to the benthic communities that may be exposed to electromagnetic fields. And within the IC's working group, the uh, WGM Red Group that we're part of, we really try to con uh, consider the pressures that are placed on our uh, environment in terms of a, a very broad context. So we try not to focus just on a single species that's of uh, maybe our, our species of interest to study, um, the ones that are favourites, but we try to consider the, the benthic communities as a whole and also consider the direct and indirect consequences of the pressures that we're interested in. So this is a bit of a flyby uh, in terms of what we, we might know. So we consider bacteria first. We do know that some species are mag magnetotactic and so they may well be responsive to uh, an EMF. We also uh, more recently have some studies that are coming out in terms of how the magnetic fields may influence the biofilm development. We have recent information which has informed us of the influence of magnetic fields on polychaete behaviours, so in terms of how they may change the burrowing activity. We also have some information from bivalves, and so we know that uh, exposure to magnetic fields may change their, um, change, uh, create changes in immunological pathways or genotoxic and cytotoxic responses. Some of our best information comes from um, the Caribbean spiny lobster, and that led us to start investigating the crustaceans. And through our study with exposure to the cross sound cable, we know that the American lobster changed their exploratory behaviour in response to a cable EMF. We also know from aquarium studies that juvenile European lobsters didn't respond to a magnetic field, which was a gradient. We have some information on lobster, uh, sorry, on crabs as well, um, from 
aquarium studies, we have learned that uh, exposure to magnetic fields may change, may attract, sorry, crabs may be attracted to electromagnetic fields and may be attracted to shelters exposed to electromagnetic fields, sorry. Uh, and in addition to that, we have learned a little bit about their hormonal uh, changes at stronger, uh, stronger magnetic fields. We also have some information from uh, crabs, rock crabs in the US been exposed to cable EMFs. Um, and they concluded that there was no difference between the exposure to a powered or unpowered cable, and also that the, um, the crabs could still pass through the cable, uh, and that would be okay in terms of they might be able to pass the cable and still be caught. When we move more to our benthopelagic uh, communities, then we have um, most information available to us from the elasmobranch species. And from the study of cat sharks in aquarium studies, we have uh, some information available to us on their ability to differentiate between AC and DC fields and possibly not differentiate between artificial and um, natural fields. Mm -hmm. We also have some information from skates and rays which would suggest that they will change their exploratory and foraging behavior in response to a cable EMF. When we move over to some of our more migratory species and where we have a good understanding of the fact that they will use the geomagnetic field uh, as part of their migration um, path and, and how to direct their movements, then we start to have emerging research on the abilities of a uh, salmon smolts um, and how they've been exposed to uh, cable EMFs. And we also have some information from eels about how they respond to cable EMFs, and we have an ongoing study on that species as well. So you'll be perhaps surprised that I would describe that volume of information as a patchwork. We have some information from some species, and they've all been studied in really quite different ways. And so we'll just briefly review some of the techniques that have been used. And these are also the techniques that are available to us going forward. And so uh, many of the studies that um, I've mentioned have used either free ranging studies. Uh, so that's allowing the exposure of animals to electromagnetic fields of both artificial and um, natural and sources and in, in the environment. Um, or you can use a mesocosm approach where you have a semi-controlled environment and that allows you to control the exposure levels uh, or times rather uh, of the animals. Or you can expose the animals to individual components of the electric or magnetic field in an aquarium setting and you have even more control under that setting. And then within those different techniques, you also have a variety of ranges of exposures. And so we start to see how the patchwork comes together. You may expose the animals to an AC or a DC field, and you can use a whole variety of intensities uh, in, in order to try and elucidate how those animals might respond to electromagnetic fields mm. in terms of the intensity. So that is um, ranging from micro Tesla all the way through to milli Tesla. And then in terms of the spatial variability of what the animal is actually presented with, the animal may be experiencing a gradient of electromagnetic field or a uniform. Uh, exposure to, uh, electro, uh, to a, a component of the electromagnetic field. And then within the different uh, techniques that are used, you also have a, a whole variety of temporal exposures. And um, so, for example, in a natural environment, uh, our study only exposed the animals for 20, 12 or 24 hours. And in the aquarium experience, you may be able to extend the exposure for a week. So then, if this is our current knowledge base, we have to ask the key question, how is this relevant to the offshore wind industry and how the electromagnetic fields are presented to our animals and with, with the cables that are used? In order to advance that knowledge base, we really need to be able to understand a lot about the animals and how they may interact with the electromagnetic environment, as well as how they may interact with the cable EMS. And the likely encounter rate uh, as well as their movements and the different life stages all have to be taken into consideration. But this has to be coupled with information from the cable properties and how that changes the electromagnetic fields that are presented to the animals. And we have to make sure that that's contextually relevant to the offshore wind farm industry in order to answer the questions that we're being asked. In addition to that, electromagnetic fields don't exist 
in separation from other factors that are presented to them. So we might have to also consider the artificial reef effects. Some cables may present uh, artificial reef effects with the, the cable protections that are used, others won't. And in terms of the studies that we, we do going forward, we might want to consider those things together, but we also need to separate them in order to truly understand the effects of electromagnetic fields. And then we need to take a step back and really understand the other pressures that come from uh, the environment that our animals are exposed to, and they're the, the cumulative pressures that we talk about. So coming to the end now, I um, just want to highlight that although we do have some information from a whole variety of species and that patchwork does exist uh, and we can draw on that the best, to the best of our ability, in order to move forward in order to, to reach our desired knowledge base, we need information to come from both sides. We need to understand more about how the species perceive the electromagnetic fields as they're presented in a natural and anthropogenic environment. And we need to understand how the electromagnetic fields change with the different cable properties as they're presented to our animals. And that will take a, a varied approach and, and will require information to be drawn from multiple disciplines. And we will need stakeholder input going forward in terms of really figuring out how to, how to move forward with that. And with that, I will stop. Uh, thank and you, thank Chloe. Everyone. I really appreciate that. Very yes. interesting. Good, good discussions about EMF and, um, and noise. Um, so Monique. Um, Monique's going to take some of the questions from the panel. I mean, I'm sorry, from the participants. Hi there. Great presentations. Thank you. Uh, we've had a few questions about specific species that may be impacted that were not mentioned in the presentations, and those were squid and sand lance and the effects of uh, either EMF, noise, or uh, vibrations on these species. So maybe Zoe, can you comment on either of these species or Peter or Luis, a squid or sand lance, if they're Well, let's start with Zoe. Uh, sure, that will be a relatively short answer. Um, <laughs> I, we don't really have uh, that much information on whether or not uh, squids are able to detect electromagnetic fields. We know that they can uh, change their movements and that adjusts their bioelectric field that they produce. Um, but in terms of whether or not they can uh, respond to electromagnetic fields, we don't have a starting point on that. Uh, so that's a knowledge gap. And um, to my knowledge, there's no information on uh, sand lines, but I think that might be more orientated towards you, Louise. Louise? Uh, yes, so uh, in terms of squid, um, actually one of the more better studied invertebrates regarding noise impacts. Um, there has been uh, a handful of papers regarding impulsive sources, um, which I could um, provide links to in the chat box. Um, regarding sand lance, um, obviously that's a fish that lives um, kind of partially buried in the seabed. Um, and so that's particularly interesting. Um, I'm not aware uh, for two reasons. Firstly, um, it may be um, very reliant on seabed vibrations um, uh, in its everyday life. And of course, being buried in the seabed, it would be highly um, <clears throat> uh, well, well within the range of, of, of anthropogenic seabed vibrations and detecting those. Um, I'm not aware of any studies relating to seabed vibrations and sand lance. Um, and I'm not actually familiar of, uh, with any studies regarding. Um, waterborne sound and sound lance either. Thank you, Louise. Okay, um, um, actually, we'll go right to Monique. Another question? Sure, actually, this question is aimed at Peter. It's from Rich. He asked, you studied the sound effects during installation of a monopile six meters in diameter. Those proposed for offshore turbines could be up to 10 meters. Can you comment on the magnitude of noise or the frequency of this change from six meters to 10 meters in your experience? I try to make it short. Uh, that will require a, a bigger hammer. And every time you double the energy, you increase the noise level, if I remember correctly, 3 dB. So yeah, it will go up. Great. All right. Um, hey, Cheryl, I was just gonna um, ask you to interject now. Do you have a question? You know, I haven't heard much about sturgeon, and that's something that's of particular interest to my um, division. 
um, as far as the time that they spend on the, on the benthos um, and their migration patterns. And I was just wondering if what, what studies have come uh, across um, or what you know about uh, if impacts of EMF and or noise to sturgeon in particular because of their interest as a protected species. Uh, sure, I can uh, answer that for, for EMF side of things. Uh, so we understand that uh, sturgeon are an electroreceptive species. Um, and so we are interested in how they respond to electromagnetic fields. Um, in terms of studies that have been done, there is a group, uh, Klimley et al, uh, who have been exploring the salmon and sturgeon migrations in response to the Trans Bay Cable and also the magnetic fields of uh, bridges. Um, my understanding is that they, uh, they, they do detail the responses of the sturgeon, but mostly in, uh, focused on the uh, effects of the bridges. There was a subsequent paper that came out uh, it was from Wyman et al, um, and they, they talked or uh, reported more details on the responses of uh, salmon smolt to the, the cable. And I thought that there would be another study coming out on the sturgeon. So I think we're still watching the space to learn more about sturgeon and response to the Trans Bay cable. But Klimley et al do uh, discuss the response to magnetic fields in re uh, relation to bridges. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, Monique, all right, we're going to do two more questions and then we're going to have to end. Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to ask Zoe a question here. Uh, Zoe, you mentioned that we had have a patchwork of knowledge with respect to our understanding of EMF. And based on this and your research, can you just maybe talk about what you think future efforts should entail, what data gaps we have, and how we might move forward? Uh, yes, <laughs> I can try to, to talk about that. I think rather than talk about any particular species, uh, I think we'll, we'll have to uh, make that decision together with the stakeholders as to which species we explore. Um, but in terms of the approach, I would definitely really like to see a multidisciplinary approach with information on uh, the contextual real contextual information as to how EMFs from offshore wind farms will be presented to the species. And so that is going to consider, is really going to need that collaborative uh, nature in terms of the studies going forward, not just ecologists or biologists, but also the, the cable engineers and the, the industry to tell us what the cable configurations will be as well. So really ecological context, if there's anything that I want to come from this, it is the relevance of the studies going forward in, in that ecological context as to how the animals will be presented with the EMF. Uh, we had a question from Dave Monty. This is aimed more towards Peter. What are the most successful pile driving mitigation methods used in Europe and how much less noise might there be using these methods? Oh, I, I think I showed them. I mean, the bubble curtain is, is, is used regularly. It, it's actually a law in Germany to use it. And then you have this, this uh, internal bubble screen that is used uh, on top of that. And uh, you reduce the sound pressure level with about 20 to 25 dB. And you, use the part, you reduce the particle motion with about 30 dB. So it is a substantial reduction. However, bubble curtains blow away. So just that's the problem with the bubble curtains if you just use a sing, uh, this big diameter bubble curtain. Really great question. So thank you everyone for engaging. I know there was a, we, we had this action packed, jam packed um, information. Um, we will be again sent. So thank you panelists, we appreciate it. Thank you um, uh, participants for your great questions. Uh, we do have an Ask the Expert section of our URI Offshore Renewable Energy website, and we will uh, work to respond to some of these additional questions that weren't um, answered today.